All right. Brother Les Butner's coming. He's going to minister to us. And we appreciate Brother Les. He's been a blessing to us since Sunday. He would have been a blessing to us before that, but I didn't know him. But uh, one time we've known him, he's been a blessing to us. And uh, he'll be a blessing to you this morning. Can't go wrong singing about the blood. Some say that you don't have to mention the blood That it's just too old-fashioned anymore Well, you got here too late I'm already on board And I'll ride this ship to the shore I'm riding this old ship of Zion So many before me rode it safely o'er Jesus, the captain, has lost no, not one. So I'll ride this ship to the shore. Listen to this now. What it took for others, it still takes today. A washing from that crimson flow. Confessions at Calvary cleanse every sin stain and makes one whiter than snow. And I'm riding that old ship of Zion. So many before me rode it safely o'er. Jesus, the captain, has lost no, not one. So I'll ride this ship to the shore. Jesus, the captain, has lost no, not one. So I'll ride this ship to the shore. I'll ride this ship to the shore. Amen. So wretched and vile was I in sin And no way to make myself clean But a fountain flowed from Emmanuel's veins and washed me clean of every stain when his blood fell down from the cross so freely he gave for this cause my soul is clean and sure in God when his blood fell where my sin was. Twas not by works that I could boast of, nor any good that I had done, but it was by his grace. And in my place, God gave his precious son. I want to sing that verse again. Boy, what a verse. So powerful. Twas not my works that I could boast of, nor any good that I had done. Here it is. But by his grace and in my place God gave his precious precious son when his blood fell down from the cross so freely he gave for this cause my soul is clean and sure in God when his blood fell 
where my sin was my soul is clean and sure in God when his blood fell where my sin was well I'll tell you that uh, preacher said years ago that'll put rabbit jeans in your feet thank God for that grateful for the blood that was shed you know I was reading this morning and I was thinking about our Christian school and Brother Marks. Back in 1980, uh, they tell us that around 80% of the people in America were members of a, active members of a church. This year, I just looked this stat up a few minutes ago. This year, the average in America is 33%. We have fallen in 1980 from about 80% down to 33%. Something tragic is happening in our country. And young people, I want you to hear me closely. I'm not preaching, I'm just giving you this. Brother Hamlin's coming just a moment. You're our hope. You're our hope. We're looking right now, if America survives, we're looking right now at the hope of America. It's in your hands. We're gonna do our best to teach you. We're gonna do our best to tell you. I sure hope you listen. And I hope you take what your instructors, your teachers are trying to put in your mind and in your heart. We're serious about it. And we want you to be serious and accept it. This is where the lesson was singing a few minutes ago. Help us to turn this ship around. Amen. Amen. Brother John Hamlin. Thank you, Dr. Beatty. God bless your friend. Love you too. Well, we've been blessed by the young people that sang a moment ago, and Brother Butler is always a blessing. Thank you for being with us this morning, and uh, we appreciate those that are watching online. Uh, we're grateful for modern technology. We're grateful for the means that it gives us to get the message out. Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. I want to uh, bring those of you that uh, are new with us in these morning meetings and we so appreciate our brother who brought his Christian school over. Have the joy of meeting him when preaching here years ago. And so good to see him again and his son. But uh, I want to bring those who are just uh, new to the meeting, these morning meetings, up to speed. And also to review a little bit before we continue with the series. Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. And I'll take but one verse of scripture for our text and it will be verse number 23. Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, and verse number 23. And I would invite you to stand with me as I read the Word of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, and verse 23. And bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. We're focusing our heart's attention on that phrase, and let us eat. I want you to underline it. I want you to highlight it. I want you to circle it. I want you to underscore it and let us eat. And I want to continue speaking on this subject. There's still a seat at the Father's table. <laughs> Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this opportunity to stand with an open Bible for, for the main purpose of preaching the Word of God. I pray, Lord, that you'd give us spiritual eyes to see, spiritual ears to hear, and hearts that would be spiritual enough to respond to the good Word of God. 
Thank you, Lord, for not only, <coughs> not only what you're doing in the evening services, but Lord, thank you for what you're doing in the morning services as well. Move among us. Give us exactly what we need in this hour. And I pray that the truths that will be presented and preached will live long and large in each and every one of our hearts. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. Somebody needs to raise their voice so all those that are in the perimeter of the Father's property would know that the welcome mat is at the front door for every returning prodigal. Let me just say in passing, they're coming. They're coming. Let me just say in passing, they're coming. You say, well, Dr. Hamlin, who is it that's coming? It is the prodigal. We don't know to what distance their return is. We don't know what difference their return is. But I promise you, as I stand in this pulpit on this Tuesday morning at the very end of January in 2024, the prodigals are coming. And there should be that call that is issued not only from the pulpit, but also from the pew that there is still a seat at the Father's table. In Luke 15, we find the murmuring of the Pharisees. That's the topic of this chapter, the theme of this chapter, the truth of this chapter, the murmuring of the Pharisees. And this chapter could be easily or effortlessly outlined like this, the lost sheep, verses 1 through 7. The lost silver or the lost shekel, verses 8 through 10. And the lost son, which is that's where we're going to park, verses 11 through 32. I made mention yesterday that uh, I've preached a great deal from Luke chapter 15. But when preparing this thought, it dawned on me that it is the largest part of the chapter and the largest part of the parable that Jesus gives us. Now, it's just my opinion that we have one parable here with three connected parts. And when you look at that single parable of Luke 15, the physician Luke, and far more importantly, the lovely Lord Jesus Christ deals mainly and mostly with the lost son. It is well the physician Luke is dealing under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit with the lost son that a person sees the repentant backslider has a reserved seat for supper. Verse 23, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat um, and let us eat and let us eat and be merry. That two little word, uh, two letter word us uh, means uh, a speaker is referring to himself and to one or more people as the object of a verb or a preposition. So I would have you maybe circle that one word with two letters us because it's speaking not just of the one speaking, but it's speaking of others. And so here God tells us that this is not a party of one, but this is a party of more than one. The sister verse of uh, Luke 15, 23 uh, is Psalm uh, 23, 5. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Friend, you and I, those of us that are saved, need to be busy telling prodigals that there still is a place. If you've messed up, if you've made mistakes, uh, if you've had uh, missteps, I'm happy to report to you there still is a place at the Father's table. Now, this morning, I want to deal with uh, number two and number three of the five tremendous truths that are tied, that, that are tied, that are tied to a seat at the Father's table. And they're all found here in 
Luke chapter 15. Yesterday we covered, number one, a place of passion. Verse 20, and he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell in his neck and kissed him. A tremendous truth that is tied to the seat at the father's table is a place of passion. And just in way of review, let me make mention that uh, God loves you uh, and God cares about you and God is passionate about you whether you are right with him or you're wrong with him. It does not change the love of God. There is a place of passion. That is a truth that is tied uh, to the seat at the Father's table, which leads me to number two, and it's what I want to cover this morning, a place of penance. Verse 21, And the Son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy Son. A tremendous truth that is tied to the seat uh, at the Father's table is a place of penance. Now I've got to interject that it is a place of passion that's the Father's attitude that there leads us to a place of penance which is the Son's, uh, their action. It is the, oh my, it is the Father's attitude that they're sparked or they're stirred the Son's uh, action. Now you say, what is the word penance? Well, it's just uh, being sorry for sin. Uh, what is penance? It's simply uh, being uh, sad uh, of sin. Uh, what, what, what is penance? It's simply uh, being remorseful, being regretful for sin. I love, I love the uh, uh, action of this son because in verse number uh, 21, he doesn't have a cavalier attitude. He doesn't have a flippant attitude. He doesn't have, well, I'm back and, uh, you know, I'm all that in a bag of flaming hot Cheetos. No, no, no. He had brokenness. Uh, he had uh, there a burden. He, he was uh, sorry, so sorry for his sin. And when you and I truly, I mean truly, get right with God, Bible get right with God, there's going to be that brokenness. There's going to be that heavy heart. There's going to be that burden that comes with being sorry. In fact, I've often said if we're not sorry for our sin, either privately or publicly, even both I would say, then we won't be very long from that sin. You say, preacher, what do you mean? If there's not a brokenness, if there's not a heavy heart, uh, if there is not a, a burden over our sin, I mean real uh, remorse, real repentance uh, as believers, we will go back to that sin time and time and time and time again. Now there's several things that true repentance deals with. And it's all found here in Luke 15. First of all, association. Look at it, verse number 21, Father. You see a thing that true repentance deals with is association. Father, what does the son say? He has something to say to the father. When you and I get right with God, it's not, it's not what we say to uh, Dr. Beatty. It's not what we say to the school principal. It's not what we say uh, to Brother Butler or Brother Hamlin. It's not what we say to, uh, I don't know, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. No, when we get right with God, there is that association that is always dealt with. We see it here from the prodigal son, there is association. Because at the end of the day, your backsliding doesn't hurt me. Your backsliding doesn't hurt your pastor. At the end of the day, your backsliding doesn't hurt your parents. At the, oh, they're heartbroken uh, and they're sad and you'll cause them to weep bitter tears. But, but at the end of the day, your backsliding only hurts you. And so when there is a repentance that comes, uh, there's always uh, the dealing with association. Secondly, observation. Verse 21, and in thy sight. Now those handful of words, and in thy sight, will help you live right. 
Those two words, or rather those handful of words, and in thy sight will help you to do right when nobody's watching, when nobody's looking. When nobody uh, knows you, you think, and you don't know anybody, those handful of words and in thy sight will keep you right when others are doing wrong. It was Dr. Bob Jones Sr. that used to say, if you could go to New York City and do whatever you want to do and nobody know what you did, that's exactly who you are. Now, there'll be hours on the clock today that I won't be with Dr. Beatty. We're spending time fellowshipping and enjoying it and meals and having just a uh, wonderful time. But there will be some hours on the clock today, but I, I won't be with Dr. Beatty. And there, there'll be times we're staying at the same motel, but there'll be times that uh, I won't see Brother Butler. And, uh, and there'll be times that, well, we won't see uh, some of you to the service tonight. But there's not a tick on the clock of today but what God sees me. What God is watching me. What God is observant. So you can get beyond the sight uh, of your pastor and you can get beyond the sight of your parents and you can get beyond the sight, oh my, of your principal. But young person, you never, never, no, never get beyond the sight of omnipotence outside of the sight of God. And so true repentance, well, it deals with association, father. It deals with observation and in thy sight. And thirdly, ramification and am no more worthy to be called thy son. You see a thing that true repentance, not, not fake repentance, not artificial repentance. I think there's some people, their repentance is about as believers, it's about as genuine as last year's artificial Christmas tree. I mean, true, genuine, real repentance always will deal with ramification. Don't tell me that you're getting right with God and you think that you ought to sing the next special in the next revival meeting. Don't, don't, don't think that you're right with God when you say, well, boy, I ought to hold the next winter revival meeting and I ought to be the special music and they ought to just tell uh, Hamlin and Butler to stay home because, you know, I got right with God a hot second ago. Real repentance in the life of a believer is always marked by a ramification. And the ramification is I don't deserve to be forgiven. I don't deserve to be pardoned. I don't deserve to come back. Now listen, that's what we're preaching about. There still is a place at the Father's table. There still is a place at the Father's table. There still is a place at the Father's table. But if you're coming back, genuinely coming back, and you come through the front door, and you walk down the aisle, and you come to the table, uh, bumping and banging into people, and you pull a chair back, and you sit down and say, boy, I tell you what, I deserve every bit of this. You are no more right with God than a billy goat. I've never met a billy goat right with God. But if you think you deserve forgiveness, if you think you deserve pardon, if you think, uh, boy, listen, I ought to go to the front of the class uh, and I ought to be on the starting five uh, and I ought to be on the uh, batting uh, lineup and uh, it, oh, no, no, no. If there is true, genuine, real repentance, there is a ramification. I've heard my brother people say in testimony meetings, and I understand what they're saying. They say things like, if I got what I deserved, I'd be going to hell. And before you say amen there, whenever I hear that, I know what they're saying, Dr. Beatty, and I'm not being harsh. God knows my heart. But when I hear that, I always think to myself, that's not true of me. You say that's not true of you. If, if you got what you deserved, you wouldn't be going to hell. No, if I got what I deserved, I'd already be in hell with my back broke if I got what I deserved. And whether it is redemption or restoration, there is always a brokenness connected to what God has done for us. 
a place of penance. Number three, there in Luke chapter 15, a place of plenty. You see, there's, a, there's still a seat at the Father's table. But you don't, you don't get that seat without there being that penance. You don't get that seat without that sorrow. And let me just say a word to those of you that, that are not prodigals. You don't have to have a place of penance. You're in the seat now. You don't have, you don't have to sow your wild oats. You, you, you don't have to graduate from this Christian school. And bless your heart, if you're counting the days till you graduate from this Christian school or our brother's Christian school to lose your ever loving mind and go absolutely nuts, you'll be sorry. You'll be sorry. Boy, all these rules and all these regulations and man, I just can't wait till I get out of this Christian school so I, so I can go join the Marines. <laughs> and young person, if you are at the table now, don't, don't, get, don't get haughty. Don't think you're better than anybody. Don't, don't be high-minded. But at the same time, with a humble heart, you stay at the table. I wish I could say, Brother Butler, I, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. Man, I'm thankful for the home I was raised in. It wasn't a Christian home, but it was a home with character. My mother got saved in a youth camp when she was nine years of age, and no one ever discipled her. And so she didn't get right with the Lord till I'd got saved and called to preach and then I had the privilege of baptizing her. And Dr. Beatty, she hasn't missed a beat for God since and prayed for me this morning before I got in this pulpit and will pray for me again tonight before I get back in the pulpit. And man, I, I thank God for my mom and I thank God for the home that I was raised in. But, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't raise in a Christian home. Now, Mrs. Hamlin, my wife was. And her testimony is, She's never tasted liquor. Her testimony is she's never smoked a cigarette. Her testimony is she's never been to the movies. And I, I'm preaching to some young people that you, that you have the very same testimony. And, and, and when you hear about others getting right uh, and others coming back and we want them to get right and we want them to come back, don't, don't think that because you haven't done that, you're a second class Christian. First of all, they're not classes of Christians. But don't, don't think, well, man, I got I, I to sow my wild oats and I got to lose my ever-loving mind and I, I've got I've to do this and I've got to do that. And no, no, no. If you have a seat, if you're in your seat at the table, again, don't, don't get haughty, don't get high-minded, but man, you just ought to say, by the good grace of God, I'm glad I'm here and I'm not going to go out there uh, and have to come back uh, and have that penance so I can get back in this seat. A place of penance, which leads me to number three, a place of plenty. Now, keep in mind the thought, uh, the truth, uh, the, the theme of the message uh, is uh, there's still a place uh, at the Father's table. There's still a place uh, at the Father's table. There's still a place at the Father's table. Number three, a place of plenty. Verse 22, but the Father said, to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. You see a tremendous truth that is tied to the seat of the father's table there in Luke chapter 15, number three, a place of plenty. Going around in spiritual hand-me-downs isn't what God does to those who return. A place of plenty. Now, obviously, Brother Butler, and I don't think I'm reading into the verse, obviously these servants uh, knew where the robe, the ring, and the regal shoes were. And those of us that are in the Father's house, those of us who not just have a seat at the table, 
but are serving the Father. We ought to be aware of where the Father keeps the robe, the ring, and the regal shoes. Now, my brother, this absolutely thrilled my heart when I saw this in the Bible. The Father didn't say to the prodigal, now you know where I keep that robe. And you know where I keep that ring. And you know where I keep those regal shoes. You thought I was going to say Reeboks. You know where I keep those regal shoes. Now, now I'm, I'm too busy. So, so prodigal, we're glad you're back. But man, I, I got a busy day and I got a whole lot to do. And, uh, and, and, and again, we're glad you're back. But when you get a chance, go get the robe, go get the ring, go, go get the regal shoes. No. Our King James Bible says, he said that to the servants. <laughs> He said that to the servants. You know why he said that to the servants? Because the Father knows the nature of those who get right. And those who get right will never take it on themselves to get the robe, the ring, and the regal shoes. Let me try to illustrate this. Sir, in the, I believe that's salmon shirt right between these two fellows right there. Could you come and help me? Yes, sir. You. Yes, sir. And your name is? Bren? Rick. Rev. Rev. Amen. Did I get that right? Still didn't get it right. R, come on up here. R, you help me. R, I want you to stand right here. Say it one more time. See if I can get it. Your name? Rhett. Rhett. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Rhett, how old are you? Twelve. Twelve. God bless you, Rhett. Rit, I want you to stand right here, and Rit, you're going to be the prodigal. And what I'm going to be is the servant. And, and look again, and look, stay right there, Rick. Rick? Rit. Rit, right. Yes, sir, you got it right. <laughs> look, look again in Luke 15. It, it, says, it says the servants. He, here, here's, here's the service of the servants. So the prodigal comes back, and, and the father says now, he says to the servants, I want you to go. And I want you to get the robe. And so what do the servants do? They know exactly where the robe is for the butler. Uh, they didn't have to go to uh, uh, Dillard's and buy a robe. They didn't have to go to uh, Penny's and buy a robe. They didn't have to go to uh, Walmart or come apart and get a robe. They knew exactly where the robe was. And so it wasn't, wasn't the prodigal that got the robe, but it was the servants that went and it was the servants uh, that got the robe uh, and put the robe on the prodigal. Boy, that's what I want to do. I want to be in the business of putting a robe on people. Now watch this. Not only did they get the robe for him, but they got the ring. Now I want this back. I want it back. And they knew exactly. They knew exactly where. Don't you go down to the pawn shop and sell this. They knew exactly where the ring was. Because again, Brother Butler, the father knows the mindset, knows the personality, knows the, the, the makeup of those that get right. And we would never, I mean, we wouldn't, we wouldn't just march in to the father's master bedroom and pop open his jewelry box and look at that ring and say, I believe I'm going to put that on. Because the father told me, no, no, no. It is the job of the servant to go find that ring. Let me see your finger. And put that ring. Now, don't leave without giving that back. Put that ring on his finger. Boy, that's what I want to do. Man, with all of my heart, I want to do my best to put robes on people and to put rings on people. But wait a minute, hold it. There's those regal shoes. No, I'm not taking my shoes off. I'm not doing that. <laughs> but the servants, they know where the shoes are. Because the Father knows that on our own, we wouldn't do that. And not only did they put the robe on him and the ring on him, but Dr. Beatty, they put the regal shoes on him too. That means they had to get down 
lower. Hello? Lower. Lower than the return prodigal. Boy, that's what I want to do. See, it's a place of plenty. The robe, the ring, and the regal shoes were already there. You say, okay, well, how do I, how do, I do that in my Christian school? Well, if somebody gets right with the Lord, this is what you do. You get that robe, and that robe says, you know what? I want you to sit with me at the lunch table. This is going to blow your mind, but the people that you eat with every day in the lunchroom, that you think those are the only people in the whole school, they're other people. Hello? And, and you ought to just go ahead and invite somebody else at your lunch table. And because and, there's people that they're trying to come back. They're wanting to come back. They have a desire to come back. They're heading back. And you have no idea what you're just saying. Boy, I tell you what, you, you sit with me. Man, you, you, you share my peanut butter and jelly sandwich with me. You, I want you to sit with me. I mean, you, you, know, you know where the robe is. And you put it on them. I want to do that. You say, what's the ring? Well, the ring is, uh, hey, you know what? We're, we're, uh, we're having a prayer meeting in our Christian school. It's not scheduled, but we want to see revival in our church. And we want to see revival in our youth group. And we want to see revival in our Christian school. And boy, I tell you what, I want, I want you to join me. And, and, and when, you get them in, when you get them in that prayer meeting, because they, because they got that ring, it's gone. You put it in your pocket. Because they got that ring, you say, you know what? I want, I want you to lead in prayer. I want you to lead in prayer. Me? No, that's just, I'm just preaching right now. You're, you're doing good. Just stand there and smile. You're doing really good. You're doing awesome. That's the ring. And the real shoes. Say, hey, you know what? Tonight, Brother Butler singing, Dr. Hamlin's preaching in a revival meeting over at Berean. Man, hey. You go with us. You go with us. And we're, we're not going to sit up in the balcony on the last row. We're going to sit up front where we can see the whites of their eyes. Come on. Give them those regal shoes. You better be good to people. Because you don't know but what they'll come a time in your life when you're going to need somebody to be good to you. There's some Christians, Dr. Beatty, that better never consider backsliding. And the reason being, they've never helped a backslider. I want to help enough people along life's way that if ever I need some help, I might be helped. Man, I want to know where the robe is. I, I, I want to be able to know where the, where the ring is. I want to be able to know where the, where the regal shoes are. And then do my dead level best to do that for those that are trying to come back. I'm closing with this. Years ago, I was preaching a revival meeting at our church. In fact, I preach uh, at our church three times a year. Other than that, I'm never, I'm never at our church. I'm the sorriest church member we have. I am. I'm never there. In fact, our pastor, Dr. Beatty, a couple weeks ago came to hear me preach and Pastor said after the service uh, that I was preaching for, he said, boy, that's great. Your pastor came to hear you preach, man, how special that is. I said, come to hear me preach nothing. He came to get my tithe check. That's why he was here. <laughs> I used to, when I preached at our church, I used to say to folks, boy, good to have you visiting. I've never met you before. Man, great to have you visiting. And, and since they'd say to me, we're members here. Great to have you visiting. <laughs> so I don't say that anymore. But I preach the uh, Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, and then I preach a summer tabernacle meeting, and then I preach in a Sword of the Lord conference with Dr. Shelton Smith. And, and every year, those, those are the times I'm back at our church, and if, that's usually the only times I'm there. But in that tabernacle meeting, oh, a number of years ago now, on a Sunday night, we have an outdoor structure, a pavilion, 
that in that meeting, Dr. Beatty to build a platform for the choir and for the pulpit. And they, they get my first pulpit, the one that the preacher was preaching from when I got saved. And first pulpit I ever preached behind, they get that, put it on the platform. And man, we have a big time it's a tabernacle meeting. And Sunday night I was preaching and uh, I saw a fellow come across the parking lot. He had a, he had a navy blue velour track suit on. And I seen him walk across the, uh, the church property and come into the tabernacle and uh, it was by himself. And so uh, during the invitation, Mrs. Hamlin was at the piano and I walked over and I whispered to her, I said, Who, who's the fella in the uh, navy blue velour sweatsuit? And she said, well, that's sister so-and-so's son. And she said, uh, he's just gotten out of prison. And so after the service that night, I walked up to this fellow and I said, uh, hey, I, I'm John Hamblin. Your name is. I, I, great to meet you. And he was a little bit, uh, stay right there, a little bit reserved. And he, he gave me his name. And I said, well, man, I appreciate you being in the meeting tonight. I said, uh, thank you for coming. I said, uh, hey, how, how, about, how about tomorrow night you sit with me in the front row? He said, why would I want to sit there? <laughs> a little, little, you know, reserved, kind of guarded. I said, well, where else are you going to sit? I said, man, front row, that's the blast zone. That's the, I mean, that's the best seat in the house in the front row. He said, okay. So next night he showed up and he had a, he had a banana yellow, banana yellow velour track suit. And, and barrel chested, man's man, big fella. And he comes in and sits down next to me. And I said, hey, I appreciate you coming. Called his first name. I said, thank you for being here. It's okay. That was his response. Okay. Kind of guarded, reserved. And uh, so we sat together and I got up and preached. And after the service, I said, uh, hey, called his name. I said, uh, we're, we're going out to eat. Preacher's taking me out to eat. And I said, uh, you sat with me on the front row. And it's kind of, kind of a rule. If you sit with me on the front row, you get to go out to eat too. And uh, he kind of smirked. And I said, man, we'd love to have you go out to eat with us. He responded. He said, Okay. And so we went out to eat and had a great time of fellowship. And again, kind of guarded, kind of reserved. And, and, then, uh, and then the next night, and he sat on the front row. And I think the next night he had a forest green, forest green velour track suit. I thought, we've got navy, we've got yellow, we've got green. I, I mean, if we go two weeks, is he going to have uh, two weeks of different color velour track suits? And, and, and so he came every night to the meeting. And after the last night of the meeting, I said to him, I called him my name and I said, now listen, I said, you've heard me preach this week for the first time. And I said, the way I preach, I said, it would help me if I had a bodyguard. They just got out of prison. And I don't need a bodyguard, but I said, you've heard me. I said, it kind of would help me if I had a bodyguard. And I said, when I preach in the area, would, would you mind just riding with me and being my bodyguard? I said, I guess I could do that. And so I was gone for two weeks and got back in meetings, got back in town. And he heard I was in town and he called me and he said, all right, so where, where's the meeting? And I said, well, you, you meet me at the house at, uh, at 530 and, and we'll drive to the meeting. He said, okay, I'll, I'll be there. And really, I, I was wondering what color track suit is going to show up in. Never said a word to him about it, not one word. He shows up at the house. He had nice dress pants on, and nice dress shirt, and had a sweater. And uh, got my vehicle, and we headed to the meeting. And I said, now, brother, let, let me help you something. I said, uh, after the service tonight, the pastor's going to take us out to eat. And uh, he's going to want to meet you. And we're in a fellowship. And I said, somewhere... Somewhere in the conversation, it's going to come up. So, so tell me about your background. Tell me where you're from. And I said, uh, I understand you just got out of prison. And I said, I don't want you to tell me what you did. Because it's none of my business. Nor is it anybody else's business. Because if you've asked the Lord to forgive you, then it's under the blood. And an omniscient, which is a great big long theological term for all-knowing, an omniscient God has amnesia in regards to whatever you did because the Bible says, and their sins in Hebrews and iniquities will I remember no more. I said, so it's nobody's stinking business. He said, okay. So sure enough, went to the service, 
Sure enough, went out to eat. Sure enough, we sit down. Sure enough, the pastor said, now, tell me about your background. He said, where are you from? And he said, uh, mm, uh, he said, upstate New York. He said, upstate New York. He said, you got family there? Um, uh, mm, no. He said, well, the pastor said to this uh, fellow, well, what, what were you doing in upstate New York? He said, mm, ah, uh, mm. He said, making license plates. And then he said, and Dr. Hamlin said, anything beyond that, is none of your stinking business. <laughs> I can't tell you the meetings I took him with me. I don't need a bodyguard. I've got three. I do. God the Father. God the Son. God the Holy Ghost. But I was just giving that fella a way back. A place back. A number of months went by. He got a job. God was blessing him in church every time the doors were open. And he called me one afternoon, left a voicemail on my cell phone. And he said, Dr. Hamlin, I feel so bad. He said, I know you're preaching at our church tonight. This was before Thanksgiving. And he said, uh, they've called me into work. I can't get out of it. He said, but before you and Mrs. Hamlin leave the church, he said, go down to the fellowship hall. I'm going to have my mom take something that I want you and Mrs. Hamlin have for Thanksgiving. And so after I preached, we went through the fellowship hall and Mrs. Hamlin went to the kitchen, opened the fridge, and there was a, there was a sugar-free cheesecake because he's diabetic and found out that Mrs. Hamlin's diabetic. And there was a card, a Thanksgiving card that went with it. We got in the car and I said to my wife, I said, open that card, see what, see what he said. Real sweet Thanksgiving card. And then he put on the bottom, in his own pen, he wrote, thank you for seeing me where I would never see myself. Do you see anybody where they don't see themselves? And that's why we got to know where the robe is. And that's why we got to know where the ring is. And that's why we got to know where the regal shoes are. Because it's a place of plenty. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Thank you, sir. As Brother Butler comes to the piano, we stand to our feet. You can go back. Thank you. There's still a place. There's still a place. There's still a place at the Father's table. And the way you get to the Father's table, it starts at an old-fashioned altar. Our brother begins to play and sing. How about it, young people? Would you come? Would you step out? Would you say this morning that the Lord being your helper, you're going to help those that are trying to get right, that are trying to come back. There's still a seat. I've won the Father's table. Far away from God. Now I'm coming home. You're watching my the way of internet this morning. Of sin God has spoken to your heart. Wherever you're at, I've tried. just make that place an old fashioned Lord, altar. Come on back. I'm coming Come on back. Home. Come on back. Because there's still a place coming at the Father's table. Coming a place of passion, 
a place of penance, a place of plenty. Open wide thine arms of love, Lord, I'm coming home. I've wasted many precious years, now I'm coming home. I now repent with bitter tears, Lord, I'm coming home, coming home, coming home, never more to Thank you, brother, for the message today. I want to remind you, the seat's always open. You can come home. I had a dear preacher friend many years ago. He and I got very close. He pastored a church over in the state of Indiana. I'll not give the city. I preached a revival meeting for him twice. He preached for me several times. His wife got out of fellowship with the Lord. She got to the place she wouldn't go to church with him. Finally, he told his wife on a Sunday afternoon, if you don't show up church tonight, I'll resign. She didn't show up. He resigned with a broken heart. He didn't go home that night. He went to another place and over a matter of days, so discouraged and defeated, he did the worst thing you could ever imagine. You're somebody that's been going down the journey for years and years. I couldn't believe it when the message came to me. I did some research, made some phone calls. I found out he was over in the state of Tennessee. He left Indiana, went to Tennessee. Momentarily, he and his wife had got back together. I got my wife in the car, I said, we're going. We drove over in the state of Tennessee and I went up and knocked on the door. And he came to the door, I did not recognize him. Long beard, eyes sunk back in his head. Sin had taken his toll. I said, I want you to get in the car with me. My wife went in, stayed with his wife. He reluctantly came out and got in the car with me. We're driving down the road and I started talking to him. He said, let me out. I don't want to hear it. I said, the only way you're going to get out of this car is if you jump out. I said, your decision maker is broke. You're not capable of making a decision and you're going to listen to somebody who's going to make a decision for you. And I said, here's what you're going to do. We're going to go back to the house. You get your wife in the car, you follow me to my house. You're going to stay at my house, you and your wife. When I pray, you're going to pray. When I read the Bible, you're going to read the Bible. When we sit at the table, you're going to sit at the table. You're going to go to church with me. I'm not going to do that. I said, yes, you are. I said, I didn't drive this distance to play. I'm, I'm here because I love you. And I want to see you get your life turned around. 
he and his wife reluctantly came to my house. I lived in another county at that time. Two or three nights at one and two o'clock in the morning, they woke me up, uh, fussing and arguing in the other part of the house. But he kept on coming to church. After a short period of time, he got on his knees. He and his wife cried, wept with a broken heart. He said, preacher, I don't think I need to live at your house anymore. I think we got it together now. Wasn't too long after that, a church called him here in North Carolina. He and his wife went there and began to serve. Every year on their anniversary, he would call me. He'd say, Pastor, thank you for loving me enough to come after me. Thank you for caring enough about me that you would drive that distance to try to salvage me and my wife. Had two sons. Several times the sons called me and said, thank you for loving mom and dad enough to go after them. He died about four or five years ago. Probably 25 years of service after that, 25 years of ministry. Winning people to the Lord. Soul winner. I preach for him. Let me tell you something. The Bible said, you which are spiritual, you restore. That's a very interesting word. It means to set that bone which was broken, put it back in place. It's a medical term. Don't you ever look down on someone else that's not on your spiritual level and say you're inferior. The person speaking that language is the inferior individual. We don't know. You just don't know on the spur of the minute how the devil can trip you up. And I want you to understand, God loves you. He's not against you, he's for you. And you can't do a thing to make God quit loving you. You may go to hell in love by your family, but you'll never go to hell in love by Jesus. He loves you. As you're growing up, many, some of you are there now, you're in your teen years. There's a lot of problems up yonder in this world, a lot of temptation. I don't want you to drop the ball. This preacher don't want you to drop the ball. These adults in here who are responsible for you, we don't want you to drop the ball, but what we want to tell you today, if the devil trips you up, you come running back and find your place at the table because there's a place at the table for you. Amen. God loves you. We love you. We're here to do our best to keep you on the main road. If you take an exit, yeah. I want you to know we still love you. Amen. And we're going to be there to help you. Father, thank you today for your love and your mercy. Thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, that the foreign country didn't become the permanent home. Thank you for someone who was willing to come to himself and say, my father has servants that are living better than this. And he was willing to come home and find his place at the table. I pray for these young people. Oh God, put a hedge of protection around them. Give them the strength to stand and having done all to stand. And bless those here today who are teachers, pastors, as we minister to these precious young people. Help us to be at our best. Help us to do our best. Lord, that somehow we can build into them the truths that will guide them the rest of their lives. Thank you for our school and our staff. Thank you for Brother Mark. 
his school and his staff and his students. And I pray, Lord, you'll help the rest of this day to be a very profitable day. As James said, draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. Help us to be that way. Help us to have a desire to draw nigh to God. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and amen.